Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Panarski, and I'm a communications officer with the city of Kingston. You are joining us on Zoom or on YouTube for the city's information session on affordable affordable housing capital funding opportunities. Uh, we have 49 people who are registered to participate this morning. There's about 27 that are logged in. While we're waiting for everyone else to join us, if you could just take a second or two to tell us about yourself. And so this poll is anonymous and it helps us address your interests and questions. So it's helpful for our presenters to know who's joining us today. We don't need specifics, just the area of interest that you're representing. So it's 10.01 a.m. We're going to get started with today's presentation and information session. So I'm going to end our polling right now. So we've got just about everybody. There's just a couple of stragglers. If we could have you complete the poll, that would be great. This just helps us make sure that we provide the information that you're looking for. It is anonymous and it is multiple choice. So thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Welcome to the Affordable Housing Capital Funding Information Session. So today's information session is live streamed and recorded. We have 49 people who are registered to participate and there are 31 people logged into Zoom right now. To protect your privacy, people who are attending, your video and your microphones are turned off and the chat function is available for technical support questions. Going to cover a little bit of technology troubleshooting. Um, if you have problems with Zoom this morning, you can adjust your view options. So you can go to speaker gallery or spotlight. There are some resources on Get Involved Kingston, the city's public engagement platform. If you're having challenges with the um, with your internet connectivity, you can call into the meeting by phone. I'll get you to write down the phone number. It is 1-647-558-0588. And the webinar ID for today is 912-1382-9640. If you're not able to log in to Zoom again, please follow us on YouTube where the session is being live streamed and closed captioned. So you'll see that I'm sharing the poll results. They, like I said, there were 49 people registered to participate today and we had 29 people complete the optional anonymous poll about who's joining us. So there will be a formal Q&A session for today. This is how you will be able to ask a question. So you can ask your question in writing by typing in the Q&A area and we will read out your first name and your question to all participants. You can ask a question verbally during the Q&A period. The way to do that is if you are online, click the raised hand function. If you are on the phone, please press star nine to use the raise hand. And then what we will do is we will turn on your microphone so that you can ask your question verbally. If you've joined the city for a public engagement session before, you may be familiar with our guidelines for participation. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. The guidelines for participation just help us all be kind and respectful for, for each other. I'm going to give everyone a minute to review the guidelines for participation. If you have any questions or concerns with the guidelines, please use the raise hand function so that we can address your concerns.
Seeing no concerns with the guidelines for participation, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth Nordegraff. Good morning, Ruth. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? I think so, Jen. <laughs> yes, you're great. Go ahead, awesome. Ruth. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. It is, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's a little bit different to, uh, to uh, host an information session via Zoom. Uh, this is the first time we, um, we organized this as, uh, as the Housing and, and Social Ser Services Department. Uh, so bear with us. Um, I do think we have um, uh, uh, gathered some good information uh, today to share with you. Um, I know there's uh, participants on the call um, with very different backgrounds, so I'm, I'm very excited uh, about that because ultimately I think uh, finding housing solutions um, uh, in our community, uh, finding affordable housing solutions really um, uh, we really need a, a diverse group of, of community groups and developers and not-for-profit developers to, uh, to create more um, affordable housing in our community. Um, so today we, uh, we have um, uh, prepared for you uh, an overview and I will kind of ask Jen to move to the next slide. Um, uh, well, uh, well, we're hoping to share a little bit of information on kind of the housing um, market in Kingston or some housing statistics in Kingston. Uh, and then we, um, we will share with you uh, some of our local capital funding programs that we have available in the community or that we are utilizing in the community. Um, uh, and I'm also really um, pleased that we have um, Monica Guido from uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation today, who will speak to uh, the various um, uh, uh, federal um, um, kind of supports that are in place to, uh, to really um, work with our community to create more affordable housing. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think we can all agree, and, and this is not just for Kingston, but just across our um, province and our country housing and especially affordable housing and very also kind of deep deeply affordable housing is uh, is something that we that we really need to work on and and really need to um, build more of in our community uh, so again uh, seeing the variety of people on the call today really makes me uh, um, happy and and makes me kind of uh, hopeful that we can as a community create a variety of, of, of uh, creative solutions to address our housing challenges in the community. Um, I, um, I think I will ask Jen to move to the next slide. Um, and uh, I just, there we go, thank you. Uh, and I should actually mention that um, uh, I'm Ruth and I, I work at the Housing and Social Services Department. And, and I also have um, uh, with me my colleague, John Henderson, who will um, speak to the next couple of slides. Uh, and John is our staff uh, that is working on a lot of the different affordable housing projects in our community. Uh, so, and as I mentioned today, uh, really we would like to share the information. And again, looking at the list of people that are on the call, I know some of you are very familiar with our various programs. And some of you I have not met before. So I, I hope that this is giving you some overall information around kind of the various programs that are available. So we're really hoping to provide you some information on the various programs. Um, as mentioned, uh, as, as, uh, as we kind of all, um, I think, know, um, uh, or as, as a community, um, we are working on a 10-year housing and homelessness plan that we're um, a midway through. Uh, and also uh, back in 2019, the mayor uh, and, and many community partners um, formed a mayor's task force on housing uh, that created um, a list of, of recommendations uh, to really look at the, the, the wide range of, of housing development, including the development of housing, uh, affordable housing. And again, as I mentioned, we know the housing availability and affordability is, is a challenge in our community and something that we, I think, hear about probably daily. Uh, and, and we're really trying to look at ways to be um, creative and find solutions as a community. Um, and, and we also know that, that Kingston is not unique. I think many communities are, are presenting with a similar challenge. 
Um, in Kingston, uh, through our kind of uh, housing and social services programming and in partnership with, with, with some of you actually on the call, uh, we have been able to, uh, to develop affordable housing units, uh, 450 or just over 450. Um, and they have been developed with municipal or shared provincial or federal capital funding. Um, and, and they actually supported over 30 different projects in the community. We also obviously know that that's not enough if, if we look at the needs in our community. So again, we really hope that we can continue to work on projects and initiatives as, as uh, in partnership with, with many of you. And I should mention that, and, and I know John will take it over from here in, in, a, in a second, um, that in addition to the affordable housing unit development, and, and we'll speak a little bit about definitions of affordability, um, we also uh, obviously are managing as, as the city, as a service manager, uh, over uh, 2,000 uh, rent gear to income units um, in, in our community that kind of add on to the, to the affordable housing piece. Um, so with all that being said, um, I just wanted to give you a very quick introduction and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and I would like to hand it over to John who will walk us through um, uh, some slides around housing statistics and the various kind of municipal housing programs. And then uh, we will pass it over to CMHC to, uh, to share all the tools that they have at their, at their, um, in their toolbox for us to use. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Ruth, and good morning, everyone. And just um, picking up on Ruth's comments, it was interesting to see the list of attendees this morning. There was a number of organizations that have built affordable housing in the past. Uh, some organizations are building right now, and there's others on the line that are interested and have projects lined up for the future. So that's, that's great. Um, maybe, Jen, just go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So this is the housing continuum here. So this is a uh, something that you've probably seen in other housing presentations as well. It's a very handy graphic to help understand the variety of housing programs that are out there. Often one of the challenges uh, when we're speaking about affordable housing is um, zeroing in exactly what we're talking about. And this uh, image helps illustrate that. So uh, it has everything, um, the city has programs that fit within here, of course, the CMHC programs and various programs from the province fit within different categories along the continuum here. I'm um, starting with everything on the left from the homelessness programs, I'm um, moving to the right, emergency shelters, supportive housing, social housing, affordable rental housing, which is the subject of today's presentation, affordable home ownership, and then market housing uh, solutions. So uh, the lines under there, you can see them. I won't run through them all, but you can see there's a wide variety of programs that address the different areas of the continuum. So as we're moving through this presentation, just keep that in mind that today we're talking about affordable rental housing. We do have a wide variety of other programs that address different areas of the continuum, but today's the specific focus is on the development of affordable housing. And when we're talking about affordable housing, just for a quick context here, um, affordable housing is when uh, our programs that provide capital funding in exchange for long-term affordability. So a project might be built 40 units in it and 20 of those units might be subsidized with capital funding so the construction is subsidized and then over time the owner of the building is responsible for providing affordable rents in those units so this is different from uh, social housing or supportive housing programs that provide ongoing rent subsidies to tenants so i just wanted to clarify those that there's these uh, a variety of programs and today we're talking about capital funding for affordable housing next slide jen Okay, so some, we just wanted to start with some housing statistics. Of course, um, it's been a, a quite the year and, and things have changed in the housing market in, in a variety of ways. Um, this year, there was some notable positive news for the housing rental market in Kingston. In January, CMHC reported that the vacancy rate increased to two point, uh, sorry, 3.2%. So the vacancy rate is a statistic that uh, indicates how many vacant units there are in the market. Um, you can see on the graphic there, uh, the healthy market is around 3%. So that's what they say in, in, the, in the sector, they say a, a vacancy rate around 3% is a, is a market that provides enough availability to provide some balance between supply and demand. So Kingston, as you can see, it's, it's the blue line on the graph. 
and Kingston dropped quite low down below 1% in 2018 and then moved up in 2019 and then I got up again in 2020 to the 3.2% mark. So we're slightly above that healthy mark. Now it's been a unique year, of course, with COVID. So um, 2020 is definitely gonna have an asterisk on it going forward. And it'll be interesting to see where the trend goes, of course, in the next years. So the key point here is rental housing availability appears to be increasing. Next slide, Jen. Okay, so here's a graphic that shows some information on average rents, what they've done over the past few years. So the average rent increase in Kingston was 3.1% in 2020. This again comes from uh, the CMC report in January. And uh, rent increases appear to be slowing relative to recent years. So although those, although those lines look like they're pretty steady increase, it's, uh, it's quite nuanced. And you can see that the line is actually uh, getting not quite as steep from 2019 to 2020. So we did see um, the 3.1% rent increase. The previous year's increment increase was, uh, I just looked it up this morning, was 7.9. So um, from 2018 to 2019, rents moved up 7.9%. And from 2019 to 2020, 3.2%. So still ahead of inflation, but there is some uh, softening to the steepness of that line, which is good in terms of um, getting rents, rent increases under control. Next slide. And some information on housing starts in Kingston in 2020. So some good news certainly for housing starts. Um, in 2020, there was 286 more building permits issued for new residential units relative to 2019. So of course, with the low vacancy rates in 2018, 2019, the markets responded by providing increased supply. Um, in terms of second residential units, which have been available or permitted in Kingston since 2013, we're also seeing an increase there. In 2020, there was 117 building permits issued for secondary suites relative to 57 in 2019. So residential construction is up, um, and it's particularly up amongst townhouses and multi-unit buildings, which is interesting uh, because um, in past years, of course, it was the single and semi-detached markets that were uh, quite strong, but now we're seeing perhaps some um, responses to the market demands by providing townhomes and new multi-unit dwellings. Next slide. So yeah, so those were just some housing statistics and we're happy to chat about those at the end. But now getting into the programs. So there's the Affordable Housing Capital Funding Program so this is a municipal program that provides $1 million per year for affordable housing. So this has been around for a few years after the municipal housing strategy was created a few years ago, this program was, was released to provide support to actually build affordable housing. So again, this isn't rent geared to income or social housing. It's not uh, the supportive housing or homelessness programs. It's specific to affordable housing. So below market rental construction. So the way these programs are typically aligned is they're providing affordable housing for low to moderate income households. So the rents are set at 80% uh, of the CMHC average market rent. So it's a below market rent and 80% is the minimum. Um, we do have projects that offer rents at 75% average market rent. There's projects with 60%, but 80% is that cutoff for where, where we'll start to fund units. Um, eligible projects include nonprofit and private sector rental housing developments. So the large majority of the, the we've got about 35 projects we've funded. The large majority, probably um, almost 30 of those are with the nonprofit sector, as well as uh, a smaller portion of those are with the private sector. So this program is available to both uh, components of the housing sector. Um, the way funding is provided, it's in the form of a forgivable loan. So once you've provided a proposal to the city and there's been a period of negotiation and then a council approval, um, an agreement is, is executed between the city and the proponent that's registered on title for the term of the agreement. And then construction funding is flowed um, as per the percentages outlined there. So 50% at construction start, 40% at completion of structural framing and 10% occupancy. 
So by the time the building's been occupied, the, the developers receive their capital funding contribution. And then going forward, they're responsible to provide the affordable units for a minimum time period, which is typically 20, 30, or 40 years, depending on the agreement. Uh, project proponents must commit to renting funding units at an affordable rate for a defined period of time. So again, the negotiation process will figure out what that rent is, what the affordable rents will be, and what the time period of the agreement is as well. And then provided the affordable units continue to be rented in accordance with the funding agreement, interest and principal payments are forgiven. So each year, uh, the folks that of course have affordable um, units that are on the call today will know each year we reach out and you provide us a rent roll for affordable your affordable units and provided the rents are consistent with the agreement, the past year's interest and principal payments are forgiven. So if your agreement's 30 years at the end of the 30 year period, provided the units have been rented in accordance with the agreement, the full interest and principal payments are forgiven. So as long as the units are operated in accordance with the agreement, there's no repayment of the capital funding uh, at all during the, the program. Next slide. Okay, so in addition to the local municipally funded program, there is shared provincial federal funding as well. So the city of Kingston is the service manager for housing programs in the city of Kingston and County of Frontenac. So the service manager, is, service manager administers various housing and homelessness programs with funding from the provincial and federal levels. So there's funding that's flowed through to the service manager that then the housing and social services department is responsible for distributing. So that's across various programs. So the homelessness program works the same as social housing as well as the affordable housing program that we're talking about this morning. Uh, the past programs, some of you might be familiar with, some of you received funding under was the investment in affordable housing program. And um, with uh, the new program is the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative. And so that's the, the name for the new program, but generally it runs the same as, as the investment in affordable housing program. And the way it works is the service manager gets a funding commitment. Typically it's every three years. And then there's the ability to allocate that funding across different uh, program streams, one of which is this capital funding program. So uh, just for reference, the three-year local funding allocation from the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative is 3.2 million, of which 2.6 million has been committed for affordable rental housing. Next slide, Jen. Okay, and these are just some other incentives as well, programs the city has available to support affordable housing development. Um, there's fee waivers for affordable housing. So some of you that have been through uh, planning approvals in the past, fees were required to be paid, but fees now are waived for planning applications. So those are application fees related to things like an official plan or zoning bylaw amendment or your site plan control application fees. It's not development charges, those are fully uh, payable still. Um, another uh, financial incentive is reduced cash in lieu of parkland contributions. So when you develop residential housing, uh, multi-unit housing, you're typically paying a contribution, a cash contribution to parkland development, which can be reduced for affordable housing. Um, other projects that we have available to homeowners as well, if there's any homeowners on the line interested um, or interested homeowners, there's uh, the home ownership program, which is available right now. It just opened on March 15th, and that provides 10% down payment assistance to low to moderate income renter households. And that's available in the city and the county. Um, as I mentioned, the city is the service manager for housing programs in both the city and the county. So the programs that are funded by the provincial federal levels, those are actually available in the county. So the previous slide, the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative, that funding is available in the city and the county. Um, the homeownership program is city and the county. Uh, the next program on the list is the Kingston Frontenac Renovates program. So this provides funding for urgent repairs and accessibility improvements for low to moderate income households. Um, and then there's the secondary suites affordable housing grant program that provides 
a funding assistance up to $15,000 to offset the costs of creating a new second residential unit. So those are some programs that are also available uh, to, to homeowners or, or folks that would like to be homeowners. Um, next slide, Jen. Great, and just so folks can get an idea of what we're talking about in terms of the capital funding programs and what's been funded in the past, it might give you a good idea of, of the projects that are typically eligible and, and, and what type, types of projects work. Um, so I'll just run through a few examples here uh, before, the, before I finish, but uh, this is a project at 40 Cliff Crescent. So it's a 29 unit four story building with a mix of two uh, one bedroom and bachelor suites. Um, there's four modified units in the building for accessibility and it was developed on vacant social housing lands. So often one of the big challenges uh, for nonprofits and for the private sector is finding land. Uh, land can be expensive and it can be uh, in short supply in Kingston, we have that challenge. So for the nonprofits on the phone uh, or if there's faith-based organization, churches, those sorts of things, this project was a great example of taking a vacant side yard and developing a new uh, small affordable housing project on the site. So anybody with uh, existing um, real estate holdings, you might look around and see uh, an opportunity for a new building footprint on your property as well. Um, and this project is a mixed income project. And so that's the new model. I'm sure the folks that are involved in the housing field on the phone have known this for many years, but typically when buildings are built now, it's a mix of, of uh, market and affordable units to provide for financial stability uh, within the project, but also social sustainability over time as well. So this has six affordable units, 10 rent geared income units and 13 market units. Next slide. Another project at 645 Brock Street. I'm sure a number of you have driven by Brock. It's a, it's a busy street, so a lot of traffic on there. Um, this was the former St. Mary's St. Joseph school site. So that again, this is another, in terms of project location, this was a, uh, sorry, a, a decommissioned school that the school board sold, the city bought it and, and earmarked a portion of the site for affordable housing and the remainder of the site has been developed with a park. Um, so another uh, 29 unit building, three stories in height, a mix of two, one and bachelor units. Um, it's got accessible units as well. Uh, 10 affordable units, 10 RGI, and nine market units in this project. Next slide. This project that's six, uh, 965 Milford Drive, this is a Don House uh, project. So this was a converted commercial building. So again, another uh, unique situation um, whereby this was a commercial medical facility, I believe it was, that was then converted into residential. So it provides uh, nine affordable units. So it's got nine bachelor units in there and a seven person congregate living facility. So this project uh, provides affordable and uh, transitional housing for women. So the, these three projects that we've talked about so far have all been um, nonprofit developers, of course. Next slide. Okay, um, this is 31 and 35 Lion Street. So this is uh, supportive housing for addiction and mental health clientele all one bedroom units. Uh, there's a total of 90 units on this property. And this is um, supportive housing for addictions and mental health clientele. So um, very much an important facility uh, within the city that provides a variety of wraparound supports on site to help folks uh, stabilize and rehabilitate themselves. Um, next slide. This is a project under construction at Wright Crescent. So again, another um, uh, the land, securing land is for affordable housing often uh, is, is unique or, or creative. And in this case, it was a former convent site that was sold to the city, uh, purchased by the city under a program for affordable housing. And this has uh, 40 units in it. So we're getting a little bit bigger in terms of the buildings here. Um, it's a three-story building, two bedroom, one bedroom and bachelor units. Um, there's eight fully modified units in the project for accessibility. And um, the mix is 13 affordable units, 10 RGI units, and 17 market units. So um, Wright Crescent, if you're uh, out in the neighborhood and have a drive-by, it's interesting to see the project under construction. Next slide. 
And this is a project under development on Princess Street. So this is um, the former Goodwill or some folks even further remember it as the John's Do It Center site. Um, and the city's owned this property for a few years moving through the development process. And uh, in last fall partnered with two uh, nonprofit organizations to bring forward a development proposal for the project. And um, the first phase of the project is, is gonna include um, the phase one building you can see up against Princess Street, as well as the three-story co-op building to the rear. So um, it's a 92 unit building and the 38 unit building on, on land previously acquired by the city for affordable housing purposes. Um, there'll be 90 affordable units in total in the first phase of the project. And then the third building, which is the one to the farthest left of your screen, that's a second phase of development that will include affordable units as well. So I hope those projects provide a bit of an example of, of what's in scope or what we're talking about in terms of affordable housing. Um, in the examples you saw, of course, affordable housing that is just straight up affordable housing for low to moderate income households. There was examples of um, transitional and supportive housing for vulnerable women. There was an example with um, supportive housing for addictions and mental health clientele. So, we're covering um, the, uh, a broad area of the, that housing continuum spectrum that we showed at the beginning. Um, so affordable housing, supportive housing, uh, developing new, that, that's all within scope in terms of these programs. Next slide. So just some summary comments before I turn it over to uh, Monica from CMHC. Um, but just as a reminder, the affordable housing program is in addition to ongoing rent geared income housing, supportive housing and homelessness programs. So those are three other very important programs, um, but, but uh, this is, this is a, a different area of that housing continuum. Um, just in terms of what's in the pipeline coming, we thought it would be interesting to show that there's 110 affordable units that are in development right now. So those are projects that have received some level of funding commitment. Um, there's 120 supportive housing units slash bedrooms under development that have been allocated funding. And this doesn't include projects that other community organizations are working on. So in total, there's those 230, 230 there, but there's also projects that are just becoming known to us or some that have been discussed with us over a, uh, over a few years. So there's, there's more coming as well, which is great. Um, funded projects include both nonprofit and private sector projects. So we're, it, it's very open in terms of what's eligible. Um, Proposals are accepted on an ongoing basis and approved relative to funding. So I think this is probably important for a lot of people are probably thinking, well, how do we access this funding? So um, we're always up for discussing projects and we do frequently. Um, we have folks contacting us uh, all the time to discuss projects, some of which might be six months out, some might which be five years out. And one thing we always tell people is that talking with us early and often is important. So if you have a project and you want to access funding or you're interested in the possibility, uh, set, set, contact us. We, we are very happy to chat and provide you some more information. And as your project moves along, keeping us informed is important as well because the way funding works, sometimes we have our longer term commitments, uh, but other times funding from the province is released uh, with very tight timelines and we might have a project that we've been hearing about and we know is moving along that we can reach out to. So it's uh, it's very beneficial to, to talk with us early and often as your project moves forward. And there's an email address at the bottom of the screen. You can choose to um, uh, contact that or myself or Ruth. Some of you will have our contact information. So um, feel free to reach out as you can. And I haven't been monitoring questions. I It's hard to chat or to, to present and read the chat at the same time, but I'll look at those now and hope to answer those questions um, as we go forward. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, John and Ruth, for that section of the presentation. We do have um, about nine questions in the Q&A right now. Um, 
we're going to turn it over to Monica from CMHC to share some more information from her organization. Go ahead, Monica. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Jen, sounds good? <laughs> Good, excellent. Well, I wanted to thank uh, the city of Kingston and Frontenac uh, for having me today. My name is Monica Guido. I work for CMHC. I'm the specialist in multi-unit client solutions. So I support um, I support uh, all uh, nonprofits, municipalities, private developers in um, the renovation or construction of new affordable housing uh, in Eastern Ontario. I've got my presentation. Can we have the presentation up, Jen? Hi, Monica. Are you Hi. able to share your presentation from your screen? I just would ah, just yes. like to keep an idea, uh, keep an eye on the Q and A this morning. Thank you. Okay, just give me one moment. All right. Hope everyone's morning is going well. As I pull up my presentation here, there we go. Going to screen share. Love technology. I wish I was in front of you all today, but uh, we can do it this way. There we go. City of Kingston. Hope everyone can see my screen. That's great, Monica. Thank you. Excellent. Just going to, there we go. So welcome everyone. This morning I wanted to speak to you about a few of our CMHC programs that support the uh, national housing uh, strategy. So as many of you may know, CMHC's aspiration is that by 2030, everyone in Canada will have a home that they can afford and one that meets their needs. This is something we're all dedicated to um, at, at our organization and our collaboration and our help has helped uh, inspire not only nonprofits, but also uh, for-profit developers and municipalities as well. Part of our housing continuum, um, many of our programs touch all of these um, sort of aspects of our housing continuum, starting from homelessness, emergency shelters, to affordable housing, which is what we'll be talking about today, and then even home ownership on the mortgage loan insurance side. So in terms of how we achieve the aspiration along the continuum, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have direct lending programs to help either build new or repair existing affordable and market housing as well. Um, we have the mortgage loan insurance and insurance to help build, repair, purchase, or refinance affordable and market housing. And we provide opportunities to explore affordable housing solutions with values aligned with value aligned lenders through our mortgage loan insurance uh, flex programs as well. So in terms of our affordable housing product offering, we often start the discussion with seed funding. Seed funding uh, to the name is the pre-construction and pre-development aspect of, uh, of building and or repairing uh, existing um, housing. We then will speak about the co-investment fund, which will then support the actual construction financing, as well as rental construction financing initiative, with both have very similar um, aspirations in terms of how we provide the financing uh, for the development, as well as just some various differences between the two uh, to meet the needs of those uh, developing. So for all three affordable housing build programs, we have a continuous intake. So you don't have to wait, you know, until this date of each month or this time of each quarter. We are outcome driven. We look at affordability, energy efficiency, accessibility, um, and, and, and a few other various uh, components of outcomes. But our main um, goal for each of our programs is to look at what are the social impacts of this, of this development. Financial viability without ongoing federal funding as well. So we want entities to have very strong financial viability and to be able to um, see the affordable housing project through um, you know, the next 10, 20, 30 years and plus. 
So here's what here's how we want to start. When we help to build, seed funding actually um, supports the pre-development and uh, sometimes the soft costs to, um, to, to the construction. So for pre-construction soft costs, we look at permits, professional fees, etc. We have funding supports professional work required for the co-investment fund application. So for example, if you want to come to us for co-investment repair, we can support you through seed funding as well. Um, even though it's called seed funding new construction, we can also support you with the repair of uh, existing uh, existing affordable housing as well. From a seed funding um, funding from a seed funding funding perspective, um, the funding looks like this. There is a, con a, a contribution of up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that's non repairable non-repayable and or an interest-free loan of up to $350,000. So a total of half a million uh, potential support that you can obtain uh, for the development of your new construction affordable housing or the repair of existing affordable housing units. Um, when we look at the construction financing, um, we, we definitely, our crown jewel of the national housing strategy is called the NOS National Housing Co-Investment Fund. And as I mentioned earlier, it this particular fund can be used for either building new uh, housing or repairing existing housing. Um, this particular fund, um, will bring us into 2029, so up to 2030 for our aspirational goal. And we've got 13.17 billion um, to utilize, 5.72 billion um, to allocate towards repair and renew. We are hoping for 240,000 existing affordable housing units to be, to be uh, uh, renovated or repaired. Um, of that 13.17 billion, 7.45 billion is allocated for approximately 60,000 new housing units. And so um, we're looking at creating mixed income, mixed tenure, mixed use communities with high energy efficiency, accessibility, and social inclusion. So when we talk about those components, all of them play a part in the adjudication and review of the financing program. So I mentioned this as well. Um, in, in terms of the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, it is a loan first program. So we are looking at approximately 8.65 billion to be allocated for um, repayable loans, again, that loan uh, function, as well as capital contributions. So depending on the social outcomes, the entity that's applying um, the, um, the, the outcomes of uh, affordab affordability, accessibility, energy efficiency, there are uh, the potential, there is the potential for contribution as well under the National Housing uh, Co-Investment Fund. As, and we are allocating four 4.52 billion towards that. Um, so part of the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, when we talk about the co, people say, well, what does the co mean? <laughs> the co is actually the partnership component. So uh, the individual or entity that's applying for the co-investment fund should have a co-investor or a partner. And we are looking for support, financial support, whether it be money or in-kind resource from another level of government, a private organization or individual, banks or nonprofit groups to collaborate and to partner to ensure the viability of the future project. And we go into a little bit more detail here when looking at uh, affordability, energy efficiency, and accessibility. We do have um, some guidelines in terms of applying for uh, this particular fund. We want to ensure that the units are affordable. We want to ensure that they are energy efficient and remain energy efficient. And accessibility is also a crucial component to our national housing strategy and specifically the co-investment fund where we are looking for a minimum of 20% 20, 20 of the units to meet accessibility standards or be barrier free or have full universal design. So this, uh, this particular component as well as others are relevant for both the new construction or the repair and the application of the co-investment fund. I may stop now and see if there are any questions. Um, Jen, would you be able to advise or do I click the question? So, uh, no, there's a handful of questions right now. Um, some have been answered in writing from okay. John. Um, 
there is, thank you, Ken. I do have a question from Ken that is specific to your presentation. Sure. Um, what I'm going to do though, uh, we did make a commitment to having a sort of a set Q and A period. So Perfect. I'll just let you continue on and okay. then we'll we'll group everybody's questions in a sounds, few minutes. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Jen. I just wanted to ensure I didn't miss anything or anybody had any concerns or any anything along the way. So uh, the next specific program that I, I mentioned at the beginning and the onset of this um, presentation is looking at the rental construction financing. This is also another financing program that CMHC has, and it is specifically to build rental construction. Uh, rental construction financing really looks at and is created um, to support standard rental apartments. So it does not include supportive housing or housing geared towards a specific group, such as seniors or, or youth. If it's, if it's geared towards uh, a specific youth, uh, a specific target group, then it no longer holds the standard uh, rental uh, apartment sort of classification. So buildings include affordable units uh, for a minimum of 10 years. So we want to include uh, affordability uh, at a very at a very bare minimum of 10 years. And this particular fund is loan cost financing. So it is all loan, no contribution. Again, it's extremely uh, competitive in terms of the interest rates. We have um, flexible access to funds. Um, with rental construction financing, you don't have to pay uh, an insurance premium as you would if you went to a financial institution and the financial institution required CMHC mortgage loan insurance. That is included in the um, rental construction financing, as well as an up to 50 year amortization and no rental achievement holdback. So very similar qualification, just different percentages. Um, we do ask for a minimum of 10 years to hold affordability uh, targets. And we do uh, ensure that this is done through annual rent roll verification. Um, we are um, looking at accessibility, a minimum of 10% of the units must meet or exceed uh, the local accessibility requirements. As you'll recall from a, a co-investment perspective, it was double, it was 20% accessibility. And the energy efficiency, we are looking for a minimum of 15% decrease in energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. So these are all the minimums for the rental construction financing program. It is an extremely competitive program because of the attractiveness and um, exceeding these cr criteria or qualifications uh, will involve a, a more successful application to this particular financing. And as I mentioned earlier with mortgage loan insurance, this is a more traditional way of acquiring construction financing, where you would work with your um, local lender, and the lender would come to us, uh, CMHC, for mortgage loan insurance. And when you are building affordable housing, you will qualify for a discount in your mortgage loan insurance um, rates or premiums. Um, so mortgage loan insurance flexibilities for affordable housing, we call it MLI Flex for short. Um, we are looking at nonprofit housing providers, again, uh, to build, purchase, or refinance, or pay front-ended lease payments to operate. Uh, sorry, it says City of Toronto. This presentation was originally done for City of Toronto, but any city uh, municipal property. Uh, the project size in terms of what we're looking for for all our projects are a minimum of five units, um, except for retirement homes where we hold a minimum of 50 units or beds. And again, we've got that standard apartment component, um, which will also include retirement homes, single room occupancy projects and supportive housing projects. Um, affordability, uh, similar to our other programs, we are looking for uh, specific criteria for affordability and criteria for uh, existing units. Um, this level of affordability, you would work with your uh, lender and you would only uh, showcase some of these um, criteria to us if the application is accepted for mortgage loan insurance flex, which is a discount on your premium. Therefore, then you would showcase um, that you are 10% below potential Rent, residential rental income and receiving support from another government program, for example. 
So when looking at loan to cost uh, for mortgage loan insurance, we have um, existing uh, projects as well as new construction criteria when we're looking at loan to value and we're looking at loan to cost as well. Um, we do have criteria around DCR as well as um, uh, components for uh, the, the composition of non-residential space to uh, residential component as well. So in terms of who can qualify, uh, developers, landlords, REITs, other investment groups holding apartment portfolios, they can all qualify for mortgage loan insurance flexibilities as well. And again, when coming to CMHC through your lender for mortgage loan insurance flex, um, we are looking for those social outcomes as well and looking at the, the, um, the component of your project and how it helps uh, the municipality as well as those in need of affordable housing. And in terms of other programs that we have, we also have the Federal Community Housing Initiative and the Federal Lands Initiative, where we look at um, at the transfer of surplus federal lands and buildings to become affordable housing. Um, and we have these um, relative programs popping up across the country where we will have an open um, application process where developers, nonprofits, municipalities can bid on a specific federal land. And currently we don't have any in this particular municipality. Um, we also have first time home buyer incentive, shared equity mortgage providers fund, uh, which are other programs that CMHC has that we're working through as part of our national housing strategy to ensure we reach our 2030 goal. And uh, that's it for me. So uh, I wanted to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I'll pass it over to Jen and I'll stop sharing my screen here. Thanks, Monica. So we have reached the, um, the end of all of the formal presentations for this morning. We're going to turn it over to our, um, it's the formal Q&A period part of our um, information session. So there were a number of questions that we received early on um, through the Q&A tool. So just as a reminder, if you have a question, that you would like to ask in writing, please use the Q&A tool and we will answer your question for you. We're saving the chat for anybody who has technical questions. So if you've added a comment there, if you don't mind uh, copying it over into the Q&A session. Um, so some of the questions that we received early that John Henderson have, has addressed in writing is, Neil asked whether or not a copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be made available. So today's session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and it will be available immediately after we end. And for a copy of the presentation, yes, it will be made available on the city's website and we will let you know when it's uh, posted and available. We just have to make sure that the presentation meets um, accessibility requirements. So sometimes that takes a little bit of extra time. Um, there is a question from Ken and he asked a couple of different questions. One is, is municipal capital funding available to projects in Frontenac County? And John answered saying the shared provincial federal funding is available to both the city and the county. And he asked whether or not there's RET supplement dollars available for stacking on new projects and if so, how much? And the response to that from John is rent supplements would need to be discussed on a project specific basic basis. And typically rent supplements are in high demand. So availability can be limited. And Lisa had a question. Is the second residential unit affordable housing grant available to nonprofits or is it only available to private homeowners? And the response in writing from John is yes, nonprofit organizations are eligible for the grant. Pierre also had a question and Ruth, what I'll do is all of our panelists, if I can get you to turn your cameras on um, and then we, I'll feed you over questions from the Q&A. Um, so Pierre's question um, was how much did Brock Street cost per unit? 
Thank you, Jen. Um, so sorry, Pierre, we just had to uh, dig through the, the numbers. So for Brock, the uh, cost per unit was 170,000. And um, I also got the data for Cliff, which is 165. So I hope that answers your question. So um, we have a comment and a question, a question from Don Mitchell. Um, he says it's great information. So thank you, John, for or thank, thank you, Don, for those kind words. He says it would be nice to know how much development costs were lowered by reducing soft costs, um, et cetera, or something to context the social ROI and ROI. So Don, if I haven't captured your question accurately, uh, feel free to use the raised hand function and I can unmute you. Who from our panelists would like to address Don's question? Um, I, I can try. I think it, it might be just posing a question of, hey, what can we do by reducing soft costs? But really the, the benefits of reducing the soft costs would be the commensurate with the amount of soft costs you can reduce. Um, so we outlined a few methods that the city has available, a few incentives, which are reducing planning fees and uh, reducing the parkland contribution. And those, of course, would be uh, directly reduced from the amount of capital you'd need to pull together to, to make the project work. Um, uh, yes, in terms of evaluating the social outcomes of that, an uh, interesting research topic. We don't have projects that have delved into that extensively. so. Um, uh, interested to hear more if, if Don or others have thoughts on that. So Don, I see that you put your hand up. I've turned on your mic if you wanted to clarify your question. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. So I think what I, I'm a lay person and I need to preface it that, uh, but I guess what I'm looking for is two examples. One is for somebody building larger scale projects, presumably there's a lot more costs that you could reduce it by and the soft costs, et cetera. So you're going to then, um, provide more benefit long term, um, you know, through that arrangement that they you take away the cost and then they commit to making the, the units lower. I'm, I'm looking more now towards small stuff where you would incentivize individual homeowners to put in second units that might be affordable, but the, there's only so much soft cost you can lower. And so I just wondered whether there was a general data that showed those relationships. Of, of those different types of builds and generally we forgive about this much money and then we get a commitment for five or ten years towards affordability that was kind of the question and i understand if it can't be answered immediately but thank you i guess i guess the only thing i'd add is that um that yes i mean direct con uh, contributions are going to reduce the costs and they're going to make these projects happen um we we know of the 450 affordable units, 35 or so projects, um, none of those projects would happen without, without the public contributions. E even the private sector projects we funded typically tend to be uh, private developers that are doing uh, a first or second project. And they've gone to the bank and they've gone to uh, different investors and they haven't been able to bring together the full capital budget. So they come um, then to to the, the public sources, the government, and um, in in the cases of the private sector projects that were funded, um, that was the feedback we heard was this project wouldn't have happened without without the public coming to the table with some money as well. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but but very uh, very assuredly, none of these projects would have happened without without the funding contribution. So it, it's key to making affordable housing work is to have have a capital contribution component to the project. Thank you, Don and John. Um, so Patricia, we're going to answer your question next. Um, Patricia has reached out through the chat and she said that she noticed that there were some questions that may have disappeared from the Q&As. So if you're due to Zoom and you're wondering where those questions went, you'll see that there are three little tabs at the top. One says open, one says answered, and one says dismissed. So when we as panelists, we answer a question, what happens is that they, they, they may appear to disappear, but they move over to answered. So all the questions that are asked today, they will be um, 
included in a reporting out document that um, will be shared by the housing team. Um, so if you're looking for something that has already been asked, please click on that um, answer tab. Um, so Patricia, I hope that answers your questions about the about where the questions are going. So to your specific question about the presentation is how many individual projects are there with the 110 units mentioned on the slide? Which specific projects have been allocated available dollars? And then the same question for supportive units. Um, is there a member from the panel who would like to answer that one? Yeah, I can I can answer that um, by saying, um, and I'm I'm going to be honest. I, I think it's easiest if if I may that we give you that in the reporting out with the overview. Um, we have obviously, you know, uh, to John's presentation, we have allocated funding to a couple of different projects. But I just want to make sure that I give you the overview and the numbers. Um, so I'm not gonna omit any information if that's okay. Patricia, you're welcome to, if you wanted to use the raise hand function, if um, you wanted to follow up on that uh, Ruth's question or Ruth's answer. Um, there was a question that came in from Ken that Monica has answered in writing. And his question was specific to CMHC. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read Ken's question and then Monica, uh, you can just maybe answer to the entire attendees. So I just also wanted to note that we had 49 people register to attend on Zoom. We have six people following along on YouTube and we have 39 attendees right now with us on Zoom. So Ken's question was, seed program requirements have changed in recent years and have actually made this program less accessible to nonprofits who want to do pre-development work. Despite substantial feedback, program requirements have not changed. Is CMHC planning to make this funding more accessible to nonprofits? So uh, Monica, can you um, answer Ken's question just verbally so that everybody Absolutely. attending is able to understand? Absolutely. So I, I wanted to thank you, Ken, for providing um, your, your comment. I would like to hear more. So I put that in the chat. Um, if you and I could speak via email, I'd love to hear what components of the seed funding um, has been, uh, you know, a, 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 an obstacle uh, for nonprofits or what components in plural. Um, the program has evolved and we have increased the funding substantially uh, to half a million few years ago, I think it was as low as 50,000 and then 150,000. So now we're at half a million. But if there are specific criteria that's not um, not being not working well for nonprofits, I, I really do want to hear more. So you can either mention it now, we, or you can send me an email with your feedback. And uh, I can escalate that to the seed team and to my management in order to um, in order to have your voice heard. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, so Ruth had also answered a follow-up question that Pierre had about the cost per unit for the, um, the Brock Street project. And his question was whether or not that cost was including land. And Ruth replied um, in writing that yes, the cost did include land. Um, I'm going to address a question from John and a question from Ken. If you would like to ask a question verbally, you can use the raise hand function and we will unmute you. Um, the next question we have from John is, after the agreement expires, who owns the property? If the agreement is not working, can you get out of the agreement? So I'm not quite sure whether or not the panel might need a few more details. Um, uh, anybody else would like to take this one right now? Sure, I, I missed the first part of it. The second part, if the agreement's not working, can you get it? Um, the answer is yes, that doesn't happen often, but you can get out, but then you'd be responsible for repaying um, the outstanding portion of the loan. And the only other caution I'd provide is if, if you're getting into this thinking, oh, maybe I'll do it for a few years and then get out. Um, uh, maybe not the best way to approach it, but um, typically uh, the agreements are 
uh, generally functions well. I, I think we've had that challenge where we've had organizations uh, come with us, bring proposals, and they get excited. And then the, the challenge is if you don't work your, um, your operating pro forma, if you're just looking at the development performance saying, okay, we need this much money and we're going to get this much from, from the city. Um, and then uh, a year or months down the road, you do your cash flow and you realize what the impact of those rents are on your cash flow. And you say, whoa, I, don't, I can't do this. Um, why am I going to rent at an affordable rate for 800 a month when I can get 1500 for the unit on the market? So um, doing your numbers, not just your development budget, but also your operating cash flow and, and seeing the impact of those affordable units, that's key to make sure that everybody's comfortable um, with what this means for the project over the 20 or 30 years that you can operate it. And if, if, and so, if, first part of the question, I, I might be able to work on that. Yeah, the, sorry, just to jump in on that, the first part of the question is who owns the, um, the property after the agreement expires? Um, so um, the ownership, obviously, let's say it's like a, a, a housing developer that uh, develops the property, that housing developer would, would own the property. Um, it, to John's point, um, let's say we, we would have a 30-year agreement in place for the affordability. After those 30 years, um, you know, obviously that, that agreement ends, but, but the, um, the, the developer would, would still own the property. And I think John spoke to this. We have a variety of um, approaches uh, that we have used over, over time. We have some agreements that are um, afford providing affordable units in, in kind of perpetuity. Uh, we also have live, uh, like set timelines uh, for certain projects. And again, that always is uh, negotiation and, and depends on, on, the, on, the, on the project. Thank you. So we'll go on to a question from Ken, and then we have uh, additional questions from Janet and Martha. Um, so Ken's question is, what share of OPHI is available for new development, i.e. funds not already committed? Sorry, I was looking for my unmute here. I think John also just unmuted at the same time. Um, so as John mentioned, um, uh, we have, and Ken, I think you know this uh, quite well as well, we have a three-year, typically the cycles of OFI and Kochi come in three years uh, provincially. We're now in the, we just started, or we're almost in year three um, of the OFI and Kochi contribution. Um, I, I think John would have the exact number, um, but I think we, uh, as we've mentioned, and I think there's another question coming from, from, uh, from Janet regarding the county. Um, across the board, we, uh, we really would like to, uh, to talk to people that are working on uh, proposals. Um, unfortunately, OFI and Kochi contributions are specifically um, earmarked for specific years. So I think we have about, uh, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have about eight hundred or nine hundred thousand um, dollars unallocated OFI dollars for year three, um, and again, we, we we do need to spend that in year three. So that means um, April first, uh, or we need to commit that by the by the end of the year. Um, so again, we we really are always as a service manager trying to align projects and kind of this the 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 timing of the projects with the, the provincial dollars that we may or may not have available. Um, in addition, obviously we are uh, awaiting, uh, you know, the um, hopefully future contributions from the province for uh, after 2021. Uh, but at this point we have not uh, received any, any news for after 2021. Uh, John, feel free to chime in if, if I've missed anything there. No, I think that covered well. Thanks guys. We have, it looks like maybe two more questions for this session. So I'll go to Martha first. If Martha would like to ask a question verbally. So I'm just gonna turn on your microphone now, Martha.
There you go. It's all yours, Martha. Martha, it looks like your mic is on, so you're welcome to ask your question. If you're having troubles, feel free to add it into the Q&A. Okay, Martha, we're not able to um, we're not able to hear you, so we're going to go over to Janet's question. Um, you can add your question into the Q and A so that we can make sure that we get it. So Janet's question was like what Ruth had said: is do we know if Frontenac County offers a program to encourage secondary suites, or if there's been discussion on this subject? Thank you, thank you, uh, Jen and Janet. Um, obviously. Um, that is a conversation that I think would be helpful to have with um, the, the various townships in, uh, in the county office. Um, I, I know obviously the information that John provided is specifically for the city of Kingston and the, the planning department has worked on uh, obviously the, the bylaws regarding secondary suites in the city of Kingston. Um, I, I cannot speak for, for where the county and the different uh, townships are with secondary suites. I don't know, John, if you have any information on that, um, but that would really be, I think, a conversation with the county office and the townships. Yeah, yeah, I just add that um, secondary suites are a land use thing, a zoning matter. And while uh, the city of Kingston is service manager for housing programs, um, secondary suites aren't specifically a housing program, they're, they're a zoning matter. So that's something outside of our purview, but certainly something that speaking with your local township office, they would have some uh, information from you because uh, secondary suites are, are legislated housing format at the provincial level. Thank you. We have a follow up question from Andrew and his question is for Monica and he asks, has CMHC looked at grading adjudicating files based on the longevity of the affordability agreement, in particular offering more incentives, um, incentives for projects ex exceeding 20 years. So Monica. Yeah, we definitely do that. We definitely um, adjudicate based on um, all, all the components. So, um, you know, all, uh, under the co-investment fund, we do look at affordability, partnership, accessibility, and energy efficiency. So it's a four-pillared approach. So accessibility alone wouldn't grant you, you know, an approval. However, having all those components together and exceeding them will allow you the opportunity to have more, um, more contribution, um, depending on how the social outcomes are impacted. Um, we have some guidelines for contribution versus loan online under our program. Uh, if you just Google uh, CMHC co-investment fund, or I could put the link in the chat, it'll give you more of an idea of how the um, adjudication works in terms of a um, an example of loan versus contribution, depending on the group that's applying. So I could do that. Thanks, Monica. Um, we had a comment from Janet come in through the Q&A and her comment was that the secondary suites issue is one of the challenges with governance. Um, this looks like we don't have any other questions from uh, our attendees. Um, so does anybody from the panel have any closing remarks that they'd like to share before we sign off for the morning? Um, well, I'm happy to uh, to just for two seconds. Um, I want to thank everybody for for your questions. I know it's really there's so many other pieces to unpack. So I, I appreciate that you might have more questions. Um, please do uh, reach out to us. Um, uh, I know John provided um, the email address, which is housing at cityofkingston.ca. Um, and I recognize that you know, as as you could see on the housing continuum. Um, we, we have so many, uh, we, have, we have a lot of work ahead of us as a community to, uh, to create housing solutions. So um, really 
we like to hear from you. If you have any projects, any ideas, any questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and I would like to thank Monica. I know um, Monica, I probably think that you, <laughs> you also would love to hear from people if they have any questions or if they'd like to speak. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to also uh, uh, share what CMHC has to offer for the city of Kingston and the county of Frontenac. So um, really appreciate everybody joining and, um, and hope that we will hear from you. Oh, wait, sorry, before we go, we just had one sort of last um, quick question come in, come in from Zach. Um, and then we will, uh, we'll wrap for the morning. And Zach's question is what qualifies rent as affordable? I think this is a question we get quite often. Um, Ruth or John? Sure. Yeah, definitely something that comes up often. And um, and it's really specific to each household, right? Depending on what your other costs are and those sorts of things. But um, like any program, we have to set some thresholds. So the way these programs work is affordability. So to be eligible to get funding under the municipal program and the shared provincial federal, the rent is set at a below market rate and the cap is at 80% of the average market rent. So just for reference, um, right now, the average market rent for a one bedroom unit uh, measured by CMHC in 2020 was uh, $1,145. 80% of that would be $916. So that would be the rent inclusive of utilities. Um, but that's, that's the minimum. We, we have units at 75%, 60%. So it's, the, it's a negotiation process. And typically the lower your rent goes, the greater the capital funding contribution. So hopefully that helps uh, to understand a little bit more. I just wanted to add uh, to John as well. So in terms of CMHC, the, the different funding programs, for example, co-investment uses the median market rent as per our housing market information portal, portal. However, the rental construction financing, you have two choices um, in order to showcase your project to be affordable. We will use uh, for the rental construction financing, we will use Medi um, total median total family income um, and then a reduction of that as well. So different programs have a different definition of affordability according to CMHC as well. So I would I would ask that you connect with me and we talk through your project if you have one and um, and we look at the, the various opportunities you'll have in order to showcase affordability depending on the program that you apply for at CMHC. Great. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, John. And thanks, Ruth. Um, so that concludes this morning's information session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. This session was closed captioned and is recorded on YouTube, so it'll be available immediately following the session. And then later on, um, we will make the presentations available on the city's website. Um, like I said, we had 49 people registered to participate. We had 30 keep on to the end of the presentation. Um, so on behalf of the city, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your Monday.